Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love him and to serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. O Lord our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world so that your church may worship you in peace and joy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson for today is taken from the Old Testament book of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 14, through Jeremiah 20, verse 6. Jeremiah spoke the word of the Lord and was persecuted because of it. But even when the, with the threat of harm, it did not stop him from speaking the truth. We read, Jeremiah then returned from Topheth, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy, and stood in the court of the Lord's temple and said to all the people, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Listen, I am going to bring on this city and the villages around it every disaster I pronounced against them, because they were stiff-necked and would not listen to my words. When the priest Peshur of son of Immer, the, the chief officer in the temple of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these words, he had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. The next day when Pashur released him from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, The Lord's name for you is not Pashur, but Megor Mesabib, which means terror on every side. For this is what the Lord says, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. With your own eyes, you will see them fall by the sword of their enemies. I will hand all Judah over to the king of Babylon, who will carry them away to Babylon or put them to the sword. I will hand over to their enemies all the wealth of the city, all its products, all its valuables, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah. They will take it away as plunder and carry it off to Babylon. And you, Pashur, and all who live in your house will go into exile to Babylon. 
There you will die and be buried, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. This is the word of the Lord. Let us respond to God's word today by joining together and singing the psalm, psalm number 31. Please make note of the instructions by which we will sing the psalm today. Our second lesson for today is taken from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 23, verses 1 through 11. Paul, who once persecuted the church, preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and in return was persecuted for it. We read, Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. 
You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, You dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and to take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Our Gospel lesson for today is taken from Matthew's Gospel, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 24th verse. This is also the portion of God's Word that will serve as the basis for our sermon today. We read, A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body, soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men... I will disown him before my Father in heaven. This is the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Children, at this time you're invited to come forward for the children's message. We'll continue with the next hymn.
Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We will meditate for the sermon on our Lord's words from Matthew chapter 10. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, I am sending you. That's what the Lord told his disciples in Matthew chapter 10. He sent them out on a missionary trip while the Lord conducted his public ministry here on the earth. He had much to tell them. The basic task that he gave them, he described this way. You are to acknowledge me before other people. How would they acknowledge Christ? In their conversations as they traveled, the name of Jesus would be in their words often. They would explain to other people who Jesus is. They would urge others to repent and to believe the good news about Christ. It really wasn't all that complicated. Now, not everything that Jesus told them in Matthew chapter 10 applies directly to us. Some of what he said to them was specific for the disciples and specific for this missionary trip. For example, he said to them, don't go to the Samaritans, don't go to the Gentiles, only go to the lost sheep of Israel, go to your fellow Jews and preach the good news. He also gave them amazing powers, heal the sick and raise the dead. But much of what he told them still applies to you and me, especially when it comes to the basic task that we have as followers of Jesus. In our conversations, we are to include the name Jesus often. We are to explain to other people just who Jesus is. We are to urge others to repent and to believe the good news about Christ. The Lord's command is simple. Acknowledge Jesus without fear. To encourage the disciples long ago, and to encourage us right now, the Lord speaks about some of the realities of acknowledging Christ in our lives. We shouldn't expect things to be all that different for us than they were for the Lord himself. Be realistic about what to expect. Our Savior Jesus, during his time here on the earth, often was opposed in his work. It's sort of strange as you think about who offered him so much opposition. Much of it came from the religious leaders, from the men who had God's word, who knew the Old Testament prophecies, who were looking forward to the Savior to come. But they so often opposed Christ as he preached and taught and traveled and then also laid down his life. They accused Jesus of doing wrong. As the Lord reached out to people among kind of the lowest echelons of society who were sorry for their sins, Jesus was accused of being somebody who, who spent time with tax collectors and other sinners as if he was just a blatant public sinner himself. As Christ helped people and did miracles for them on the Sabbath day, the religious leaders accused Jesus of, of breaking the Sabbath day by working as if doing miracles to help people was a violation of God's command. They opposed Jesus at every turn and then called for his death. Their hatred went to the extreme as they manipulated events, schemed and plotted, and then connived with Pilate to have Jesus put to death. It was so strange as we think about it. The Son of God came down to the earth to rescue sinners by living for them, dying for them, and rising again from the dead on the third day. But so many people, especially the religious leaders, opposed Christ, hated him, and wanted him dead. 
Now, we shouldn't think for a moment that we are above Jesus. As he spoke to the disciples and as he talks to us today, he addresses a reality that we need to face all the time. He does so with an analogy, a little comparison. It involves a teacher and students, a master and servants. As Jesus says, a student is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. On an earthly level, Jesus is saying what should be obvious to us, a student should expect to get the same kind of treatment as his or her teacher. And a servant in a household should expect to get the same kind of treatment as his or her master. The student and the servant shouldn't expect anything different. So, what Jesus met is what we should expect as well. Because we are the Lord's students, and we are the Lord's servants. What happened to Christ is what will happen to each of us. We may long for something different. Well, Jesus came into the world, Jesus met opposition, Jesus suffered and died. For us, though, it should be different. Maybe we should have paradise on earth and not have to suffer for the name of Christ. Jesus says, be realistic about what to expect. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? Imagine that. People call Jesus Beelzebub, another title for Satan. The Son of God who came down to the earth to rescue sinners was called the devil by so many people. If that's what they called me, don't expect anything different for yourself. In some way or another, believers in Jesus and his followers will take some heat for who they are. For some believers, that heat has been in the extreme. For some believers in the past, it has meant loss of property or possessions, loss of position, physical harm, even death. Among the 12 disciples whom Jesus was addressing here before he sent them out on their missionary trip, according to the records we have outside the Bible, it seems only one of them, the Apostle John, died what we might call a natural death. All the others died a martyr's death. They were put to death because of their faith in Jesus. The early church historians have the records of what Christians faced in the first few centuries of the Christian church. Not all of them, but a good number were put to death because of their faith in Christ. They were fed to the lions. They were burned alive. They had their their limbs torn off from their bodies. Why? Because of some crimes that they committed? No, because they confessed Jesus as the Savior of sinners. Some believers still today face what Jesus speaks about in the extreme. Loss of property and possessions. Loss of position or employment or career. Physical harm or even death. For other believers, it doesn't go so much in the extreme. But there is still opposition. The opposition can come in words. It seems within our country, whenever any any public figure becomes known as a Christian, a believer in Jesus as the Savior of sinners, he or she gets some public flack for it. You could do this little exercise if you haven't done it already. If you get your news online, find a news story about, about Christ or Christians or matters of our Christian faith, and then And then look in the comments that people write after the article. You you don't have to look down real far to find some rather stinging and offensive statements about Christ 
and about those who follow Jesus. Some people even saying, our country would be better off if we didn't have any Christians at all. And then there's avoidance and rejection. As people find out that friends or family members are Christians, often there's avoidance and rejection because of Christ. Now, what if you or I are not feeling any heat at all as Christians. Remember, Jesus says, no student is above his teacher. No servant is above his master. What if we don't feel any heat at all? Perhaps we need to evaluate how much we're standing up for our Savior. Our Lord Jesus says in other places in the Gospels, No person can serve two masters. So that means we can't serve Christ and at the same time serve the sinful world. The scriptures say to us that we can't be a friend of God and at the same time a friend of the world. Or as Jesus says here, if anyone denies me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. If we're trying to play both sides of the fence, being loyal to Christ and follow him, at the same time, loving the world and the things in the world, that doesn't work. Christ says it's one or it's the other. So let's make our confession with our lips and with our lives always in sync with what we believe in our hearts. And we want to. We are compelled out of love for Christ to let our faith shine before other people because he loved us first and and endured all that scorn and all that shame and the Father's righteous judgment because of our sins. We want to serve Christ. We want to let our light shine. We want to stand up for him. One of my brothers for many years was in the military. When he was in the army, he had, he had a military ID card. He told me once that if he was ever on a flight, maybe somewhere overseas, and, and a terrorist took over the flight, he'd probably be the first person to die because he had his military ID. They would see that and identify him as closely associated with the United States of America, and he'd probably be put to death. You and I are believers in Jesus, our dear Savior who laid down his life for us. We are followers of Christ. We have a Christ ID. And that means that in some way or another, we're going to suffer for the name of Christ. In some way or another, we are going to feel heat because of Jesus. That's the reality that the Lord wants us to face all the time. He's not trying to scare us away from acknowledging him. He says three times in these words to the apostles, do not be afraid. He challenges them. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Christ commands us to be bold, to acknowledge him without fear. To encourage us, He gives us several reasons. What about those Christians who have been harmed as they testified to their Savior? What if it would have ever happened to any of us that we would face physical harm because of our faith in Jesus or even death? Christ says to us, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body but who cannot kill the soul. Many have tried to destroy Christians by having them put to death. Remember some cases from Bible history. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he tried to wipe out the Israelites by having all the baby boys put to death. Or remember King Herod at the time of our Savior's birth, who thought he could destroy the Savior, destroy the church, by putting to death all the little baby boys in Bethlehem. Another King Herod, a relative of that King Herod, 
thought that he could squelch the Christian faith as it was growing by having the Apostle James put to death through beheading. The Apostle Paul, when he was Saul the persecutor, tried to destroy Christians and wipe out the church by putting as many to death as he possibly, as he possibly could. That pattern has continued throughout history. Many of the Roman emperors tried to destroy the church by having Christians put to death. Many governments throughout history, many governments in the not-so-recent past thought that they could destroy the church by having Christians put to death. None of those measures succeeded. Jesus says, even if you die for the sake of my name, do not be afraid of those who can only kill the body. Instead, Jesus says, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's not the devil, but that's God himself. Only God has the power to judge people, body and soul, and to cast them into hell to face his judgment. We are to fear God, to hold him in high and holy awe and reverence because only he can judge people to hell. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king constructed the idol that he set up in the plain, and he commanded everybody in his realm to worship this idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, Sorry, king, we will worship the Lord. Well, then the king said, you're going into the fiery furnace. In fact, let's get it even hotter than it usually is. You're going to throw in, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace and burned alive. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we might be burned alive, but we're still not going to worship your idol because we fear the Lord more than we fear you. There's another story from outside the Bible about a man named Polycarp. He was a famous leader in the early church, an old man who led the church in this one town. The local officials decided to start persecuting Christians, and one of the first people they went looking for was the leader, Polycarp. So they hauled him into a public place where the chief magistrate in the town said, Polycarp, deny Christ. If you don't, you're going to be put to death. Polycarp said, I will not deny Jesus. The magistrate said to Polycarp, well, we're going to throw you into the fire and burn you alive. Polycarp said, that fire will only last for a short time and then it will end. There's another fire, the fire of God's eternal wrath. I fear that more than I fear you. Jesus said, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. For believers in the past, for believers in the present, for us too. Whenever we face heat because of our faith in Christ, we fear, honor, respect, and have the highest reverence for the Lord himself. So Jesus says, do not be afraid as you face the heat. He gives another reason for us not to be afraid. In every circumstance, no matter what might happen to us, our Heavenly Father will always take care of us. He teaches us this basic fact through some really down-to-earth comparisons. First of all, he directed the apostles to the sparrows. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? That must have been the going rate in the marketplace for sparrows back then. Two sparrows for a penny, not much at all. They hardly cost anything. What were the sparrows to the people back then? And really, what are sparrows to us? We don't think about them very often. If we see one dead, we might just pause for a moment and then just go on with our day. Jesus says, yet not one of those little sparrows will fall to the ground apart from the will of your heavenly Father. He knows exactly what's going on in the lives of the little sparrows. Jesus goes on to say, you are worth more than many sparrows. The Father has put priceless value on each one of us. If that's what he cares about the sparrows, and he does, how much more does he care about us? 
The fact is that we as humans are the crown of God's creation. We as sinful humans have received from the Father the gift of his Son Jesus who died for us and rose again. Christ did not lay down his life on the cross for the sparrows, but for us. How much more valuable are you? So don't be afraid. Jesus also says, and even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. You want an exercise for this afternoon? It might take you more than the afternoon, maybe the whole week. Get out a mirror, check your scalp, and try to count up the number of hairs on your head. Could take a while, even if you're slightly balding. None of us knows that number. None of us would even bother to find out. Yet they're all numbered by the Lord himself. At any given moment, he knows the numbers of hairs on your head. He knows the number of red blood cells in your system. He knows how long your fingernails grow each day. He knows all this thoroughly. He knows us thoroughly. What challenges we face. What heat we are up against as we live for Christ and testify to the gospel. What causes us anxiety and worry. He knows it all. And he loves us dearly. So Christ says, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of what anybody might do to you. Don't be afraid that you'll go without or you'll lack something as you live for me and stand up for Christ. Your Father knows what you need and he will generously supply. The Lord has one final encouragement too for us as we stand up for him and acknowledge him boldly. It goes really to the end, to the end of life, to the end of the world. And it addresses this question. At the end of your life, at the end of the world, whose approval do you want? Do you want the Father's approval or the approval of anybody else? Easy answer. Christ says, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. As we face the heat for living for Christ, testifying to the good news of his love for sinners, telling others what he's done for them, we remember that we have the Father's approval right now. We have the Father's approval because through Christ and his blood shed on the cross, we are innocent of sin. We are the Father's dear children and heirs of eternal life. We have the Father's approval now. And when the end comes, either at the end of our lives, at the end of the world, when we are assembled before Christ, he will acknowledge us before his Father in heaven and welcome us into our eternal home. So keeping that biggest picture of all in our minds and in our hearts, we're not afraid to stand up for Jesus. We are bold in acknowledging Christ. Let's do it now. Let's do it today. Let's do it this week. Acknowledge Jesus without fear. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which passes all our understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in our Savior Christ Jesus. Amen. Together, let's confess the faith that we hold so dear by speaking together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We show our love for our Savior by giving him our offerings. Please sign the Friendship Register located at the end of your pew.
Please stand for prayer. Today we'll offer the first stanza of hymn 488 for our offering prayer. <clears throat> Savior, thy dying love thou gavest me, nor should I aught withhold, dear Lord, from thee. In love my soul would bow, my heart fulfill its vow. Some offering bring thee now, something for thee. Amen. You're invited to join me in the responsive prayer of the church, which begins on page 42 in the front portion of the hymnal. As the church joins to pray today, we also have a special prayer request for the granddaughter of Ross and Ann Marks and Carl and Margaret Voss. Her name is Lindsay. Lindsay's husband, Garrett, has been deployed to Afghanistan. He was deployed on July 6th, and so we'll pray for his protection and for the family while he's away. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Powerful Lord, we thank you for the ways you defend our physical lives and health on earth. We thank you for all who serve in the armed forces to keep us safe safe from foreign enemies. We pray in particular for Garrett Salisbury as he leaves for deployment in Afghanistan. Send your angels to defend him as he defends us. Preserve him from harm and danger and allow him to return home safely while Garrett is away Meet all the needs of his wife, Lindsay. Give them comfort from your promises in Christ Jesus to preserve believers in every circumstance. Lord, we bring these requests before you now in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
We'll remain standing as we join together in our final hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. You may be seated. Good morning once again. Good to see all of you here this morning. Our pleasure to be able to share God's Word with you today. A couple of things I just want to point out to you inside the bulletin. Uh, first is our Vacation Bible School coming up. You have an uh, advertisement for that or a brochure for that within your bulletin. If you have children from preschool through sixth, this is a good time to sign up. If you know somebody, maybe a neighbor or some grandkids that would like to come, you can sign them up as well. In addition to the, the sign-up sheet, out in the, in the fireside room, there's a cactus with some little tabs on it. These are items that we would need to be able to put together our Vacation Bible School. If you'd like to help us in, in purchasing these items or donating towards those, please pull off one of those tabs and then get the item requested on that tab. Um, that'd be greatly appreciated. Coming up um, on July 30th, Pastor Gartner at St. Luke's has taken his call on July 30th. Um, they want to have a farewell for him, and the people of here of, of Trinidad are invited as well. So I just point that out in case you wish to wish him well and, and uh, thank him for the ministry he's had in our school over the years. Otherwise, I'd say take a look at the bulletin. We have a blood drive coming up, and read through all the other many announcements. And may the Lord bless your day.